So today I've got Paul Connor. How are you doing, Paul? Good mate, thank you. Right. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. No, this is uh, this is great. It's absolutely great. Been looking forward to this one, to be honest. Um, talking about games, computers, and uh, we'll get a bit of martial arts in there as well. Cool. So first question, mate. Completely off the cuff, these questions are going to be. Um, what was your first computer? Uh, very first computer was an Amstrad uh, 6128. Loved it. It was kind of a... They were expensive back in the day. Even that was... I think that was the cheapest with a monitor and all the rest of it. But, um, yeah, I remember my mum and dad brought us the second-hand 6128 and it was to be shared between uh, me, my older brother and my older sister. But, you know, I kind of ended up, luckily hogging it for most of the time um but absolutely loved it i think the first game i ever saw running on it was 3d grand prix just okay. blown away because there's nothing i mean back in the day it was all like uh you remember the little lcd games the little handhelds like absolutely. nintendo made a few but then you had the ones that were like the goggles that you put to your eyes and stuff oh, yeah the view, view, the, the view 3ds they were weren't they? yeah the yeah, yeah. game and stuff yeah i remember yeah, yeah. Those, so, yeah so that's kind of all i was really used to these novelty well you say novelty name but back then they were probably like cutting edge but um mm. these lcd games and then to see that running on an amstrad because it to us back in the day it kind of looked like 3d even though you knew yeah well you know now it, it really wasn't but it was impressive and uh yeah i just remember being blown away by that and obviously when i first saw it running i, I had no idea that you'd got to kind of wait for that thing to load up <laughs> yeah. so we had the, we had the, the um floppy disk so it wasn't so bad but even that was like you know it could take take a little while to get into a game with the loading the, the good old days was phenomenal loved it still uh, i've got um i think we've got about four four amstrads upstairs so i've got yeah okay yeah i've got quite a few amstrads i've got a bit of a Bit of a thing for them okay. yeah I've, i mean i've got like commodore and spectrum uh i've got the spectrum plus two actually is it plus two is spectrum that the, the the amstrad one yeah the amstrad yeah it's got the amstrad casing on it um, it's all in one unit the gray one yeah so there's the i did two revisions there was that one that yeah one? yeah so i did the black one and the gray one yeah yeah no i've definitely got the gray one I've yeah. got the grey one. So I've got the, the AI, box. I think. Yeah, so so I got that. Um, I actually got got sort of almost given that. It cost me, uh, I think it was sixty quid. Okay. That's, yeah, that's sixty pound for anyone watching, not in the UK. Quid. <laughs> sixty quid. <laughs> sixty quid. Yeah. It was sixty pound, um, and it come with loads of games in the box, immaculate condition. It was like a bargain, but they knew that I collected the stuff, so. It was either that or they were going to give it to some, you know, relative who probably wouldn't appreciate it and all the rest of it. But, um, Sell it on yeah, it's not that for a still, but yeah, the Amstrad is weird as well because, like, you're, you're very much into the spectrum, aren't you? Mm. So, like, the spectrum's your, your thing, and you've probably got like loads of nostalgia for that growing up. But I don't know if it was an area thing, but the Amstrad seemed to be like prevalent in this small area where I live. Right. So, all of my friends at school, yeah. You know, there was only one one of them that had a, a spectrum, so mm. he was like the odd one out. Whereas, you know, if probably five miles down the road, we'd have been the odd ones out for some reason. Everybody in this area, they all had the four six four. Um, so you know, there was a lot of tape sharing going on. It's, the double deck it's play weird. record, yeah, yeah, yellow tape over the right protect hole. That's it. You know the score. Yeah, yeah. that's there, it. There was loads of that going on. Um, but yeah, so breaking the law at like seven years old, eight <laughs> years old. Oh, we've all done it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, the good old days. Yeah. Double Dragon and uh, what else? There were some classics on the Amstrad. It was things like um, Boulder Dash, uh, International Karate and all that stuff was on there. Mm. Chucky Egg was the one there. I think Chuck Yeager yeah, could play that. I would still play that today. You know, yeah. if, if ever I buy like a new joypad or joystick for it or anything like that for the Amstrad, 
that's the first thing that goes on is right what's it like for Chucky e? You're quite lucky, really, to have the um, the one to eight because yeah, uh, most people did have the four six four with the green monitor, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, and it, it doesn't sound a lot. I think it was like um, was it a hundred pound difference or something like that when it came out? But you got to remember back then, a hundred pound was a lot more money than a hundred pound is kind of now. Mm. So it's, it must have been like a phenomenal increase in cost to have the, the colour variant. Yeah. But I mean, that's why we had we had it second hand. So he must have got it, knowing my dad, hmm. he must have got it for a good price because otherwise he'd have got us the cheapest. Right, gotcha. You know what I mean? So, it, you know, we, we were lucky. We knew we were lucky as well, though, because, you know, when, whenever I'd go around a mate's house, it was always, you know, on the monochrome, green screen, mm -hmm. on the 464. Yep. He's, like, waiting for his tapes to load and all the rest of it. You've got your disc. Yeah. And I've got the discs. Yeah, but there's, there weren't many games for the disc at the time either. So it was kind of like, uh, I don't know, I was still a bit envious of the people oh, okay. that had the 464. And in the end, I ended up making um, a tape drive for it out of, uh, I don't know if it was a Walkman or just some cheap uh, cassette player. Like an Alba or something. Yeah, it was something like that. Mm. Probably brought from, you know, whatever electrical stores were open at the time. But, um, market. <laughs> yeah, or the market, yeah. But you needed a special cable for it, and that was like, I don't know how much that was, but that was hard to get hold of. Because um, obviously it has to interrupt the playback for when it needs to process what it's loaded so far and then carry on hmm. and all the rest of it. So there was like a remote socket that needs to go in to stop the playback. Um because otherwise it would just carry on and it would miss its loading point, if that makes sense. Oh, right. I, I didn't know that about the uh, the one to eight. I, I was going to ask if it had got a uh, audio in connector, the same as, yeah. the, as the Speccy. Um, yeah, it's and... got, um, I don't know if it's like a proprietary socket. I'd have to have a look at, at, at one to yeah. figure out what it is, because I can't remember. It's one of these things, it's on the side of the machine and you never pay any mind. And... But... Um, you needed this special cable, and it's got the the free uh, inputs into the into the um, cassette player. Yeah. But obviously, one of those is the interrupt for the play, so that it stops it when it needs to. Um, All right. But yeah, it was quite a good bit of kit that was. It was a game changer for me. Yeah. Because up until that point, I couldn't swap games with people and share stuff. So yeah. And then obviously the sister had uh, she had a ghetto blaster for um, remember the ghetto blasters. Oh, mate, I used to do break yeah. dancing. <laughs> yeah. So I used to yeah. I used to carry my uh, my raster about with me uh, rolled up bit of lino. <laughs> Brilliant. Going up the park. She, she had um, she had one of these for for Christmas, and it was like, oh, can you just copy this tape for me? Well, what is it? Yeah, don't worry about that. Just copy this tape. Here's some blanks. You always seem to have like a two pack of ten blank cassettes floating around you. If you had yeah. like a micro computer back in the day, and uh, yeah, just constantly on it with friends, writing on the back of the cassette inserts. You know the uh, the tape counter number for each game and all that stuff went for all of that. Mm. Brilliant, magical times. Oh, absolutely brilliant, man. I mean, uh, I think you're right. It must have been a, a regional thing. Um, because you you had the three, you had the three eight bits, didn't? Well, I suppose you had four really. You had the Atari yeah. um, XE or XL, Atari XE, I think it was. Then you had the Amstrad four six four and the one two eight, Commodore sixty four. Um, if you were rich, you had the one two eight one. <laughs> yeah. And then you had the good old rubber keyed Specy. 
Um, but if I remember right, the specy was something like a hundred pound from from Woolworths up uh, near where I live in. Um, but uh, mine ended up um, not lasting very long, and I ended up with the uh, luckily the specy plus had just come out. Right. So my dad come back with that one, and I was like, oh, okay. oh, I was happy. I was like, oh, this is even better, you know. So uh, yeah, but the original perish did it. What happened to that? I I've got a funny feeling it was um, almost like dead on arrival. So I'd opened um, I'd opened this up from for I don't know if I had it for my, I can't remember opening it up for Christmas. I think I had it for a birthday, yeah. and uh, because it didn't work, my my dad was like, right, take that straight back, and they'd gotten on. You know, that model. Yeah, yeah, they they got no more of that rubber key model, and said, "Oh, you know what? We've actually got this one. Um, probably paid. I don't know what the plus was when it come come out. It probably uh, extra twenty, thirty quid or something. Still a lot of money, wasn't it back then? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, come back with that, and he said that they've only got this one. And I, I was like, "Yeah, okay, whatever." <laughs> <That was laughs> yeah, brilliant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah. all good. I I do love I like. When I, I, I try to get, because I've got two daughters, so I've got like a five-year-old and a, and a three-year-old. She's nearly four now, actually. But um, right. yeah, I introduced them to the to, to the Amstrad really like early. So I've got my uh, my four-year-old at the time, Bryce. She's now five, but she, at the time I introduced her to uh, Dizzy, Treasure Island Dizzy and Dizzy. stuff like that. She hadn't got a clue what she was doing, but just loved it. Just loved the idea of, you know, this blazing sort of bright monitor beaming these images at her and moving this massive joystick around. She's loving it. Yeah. So, yeah, trying to get them into it. But, um, yeah, a bit, bit wary because not wanting them to break anything as well. Yeah, that's, you know I mean? that's the thing, isn't it, when they're, when they're young? Everything goes in the mouth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, everything. But, yeah, they, these things are a bit too big to get in the mouth, luckily. But, um, yeah, they seem to love it. And she recognises it whenever, like... Uh, you know, I'll, I'll put it. I'll put it on the laptop, and she'll just say, "Oh, do you see?" And she'll come up, and she'll grab the joypad, start playing. She loves it. So just trying to, because the retro games are like, you know, you haven't got to sit through an hour of tutorials and uh, the hand hold, hand holding, and this is how you shoot. It's just like, yeah, uh, you, you know, you've got a shoot button. That's going to be your shoot button. Do you know what I mean? You know where you're at with them, don't you? Well, the thing is as well. Um... Because there was all that game swapping going on um, when we were kids at school and whatever, uh, you had you had these new say so, so you you made to do you a tape a compilation tape, and you'd play these games, but you had no instructions. You had to work no, it out. No. You had to work it yeah. out yourself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know there was there was no hand holding like you get with the modern console games. Or if you want to jump, press X, and you're like. I'm pretty sure I can work out how to jump. I'll just yeah, yeah. press stuff until it happens. But yeah. they they really do make you feel as though you know, you're thick as anything now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember the the magic. Of, do you remember the magic of playing? Like, did you play yours Revenge on the Atari? Oh, I've got it up there. I've got a box yeah. copy. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh brilliant. Yeah. But I remember the magic of figuring that out for the first time. Like, what is this beam here? Oh. You don't get hit by the. I don't think I did. You know, I don't think I did work it out when I was a kid. Did you not? When I when I first had it, uh, I probably would have hired it from. Do you remember when you could hire cartridges? Yeah, so I probably hired it from. I don't know. I think it was called Hole Tight in Collegate, one of right. the old video shops. I think I hired it from there, and I was like, I don't know what I'm doing here. Love the sound effects, <laughs> shooting, shooting that thing going up and down, dying a lot, and going, okay, yeah. next. Yeah, you know. no, me, me and my mate figured it out because we, we, we just didn't understand it when when we first fired it up, and it was something that I think he found, he found in the loft. It's Atari Twenty Six Hundred, hmm. no instructions to any of the games, so it really was what you're saying. You know, figure it out for yourself. Plugged it in, got it working. I think his dad was sniggering at us, like trying to figure out how it worked, but we we got to level two, which was like. Uh, Wow! You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, when you play when you play it and you understand it now, it's it's quite a simple game. But back then, with no instructions, it was like it was an accomplishment just to figure out how to beat that little 
whatever it was. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Yars Revenge classic. Did you not have um, a, a console before the Amstrad? Did you not have an Atari? No. So we, um, I think the Amstrad was my very first introduction to having anything that, that plugged mm. into like, well, that was like a television display, I'd say. Right. Um, so other than that, it was it was all of these little, you know, handheld LCD toys that weren't weren't very deep. Astro, like, uh, Astro Wars and uh, yeah, we had Astro. Ast I've yeah. still got Astro Wars actually. That's, I that's worth that's a bit of money now. That is, you know. Yeah, yeah, I've got I've got the box for it and everything, but the box is really beat up. It's not been with me forever. It's yeah. one that I brought. I brought on eBay, but that's still a really fun little game to Amazing play. Amazing game, yeah. And the, and the sound, but the bloody thing's that loud. I can't isn't remember. It? I can't remember. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd love yeah. a little Astro Wars again, but as I say, unless. Yeah. Unless you can find some car boot that somebody's just getting rid of one, if they know yeah. if they know what they're worth, you got well, it's, chance. it's interesting because Astro Wars is where the latest game come from. Okay. Because my, my brother kept saying to me because he's a massive fan of Astro Wars, hmm. and he kept saying, you know, your next game you ought to redo Astro Wars. So yeah, yeah, and then it just turned into this, you know, shooting game. Yeah. Well. Um... We'll go into that a bit later. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Re 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 yeah, for, um, yeah. yeah, I do love the Astro Wars. But I, I don't think I've got anything from that sort of era that's like that kind of thing other than that, if that makes sense. Like, I've got yeah. consoles that were later than that, but nothing, you know, no electronic toys, I guess, because yeah. it was classed as a toy. But it was like a little miniature arcade machine, wasn't it, back in the day? Yeah. You've got like the viewport into the game, and you know, the joystick and the button. Yeah. Brilliant bit of kit. I wish they'd made more of them. Mm. I mean, they've started making little replicas, haven't they, of arcade machines? But yeah, it, yeah. It, it, they haven't got the same feel. They got no, the same I'm, I'm tempted. Arcade one ups cabinets do look good, hmm. and I am quite tempted. Yeah. But again, the problem is always space, isn't it? The problem is, yeah. you know, have you got the space to be putting up an arcade machine? I've, I built my own arcade machine Yeah. Um, sort of 10 years back. I'll have to send you, send you some pictures on. But that's the four-player control deck all built I would scratch. like to see that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, well, it all needs rewiring now because it's in the loft hmm. and it's it's been alive for like 12 years. Yeah. So a lot of the wiring's a bit unresponsive now, so we've just got to strip it all out and redo it all. Which, yeah, it's probably going to be a few hours, but it's got everything on there. It's got MAME, it's got all the old consoles. Yeah. Um, using a front end called Maximus Arcade, which is probably really dated now, I'd say. But um, really customizable back in the day. You, yeah, you've probably never heard of it, but it, it, it was decent when cause that was built like 12 years ago. Mm. But back then there was that and there was a can't think what the other sort of main um front end was for arcades at the time but there were two choices and i sort of went with that because it was the one i could find the most uh information about online yeah. in terms of like how to set it up uh but yeah so i've, I've got that i've got loads of like old consoles but my, my, I mean, my real sort of um, nostalgias with with obviously the Amstrad, but the old Nintendo as well, the eight bit, the NES. Oh, okay, big fan of that. <laughs> yeah, massive fan of the NES. I still, it's like, uh, well, you can play some of them now on the Switch, can't you? So you could, yeah. if you've got the, you know, Nintendo online, you can get in there. And I was playing like, um, it come out as Blue Shadow over here, but I think it's Shadow of the Ninja. Or something like that. Okay. In America, it came out as. So I was playing that. I used to be able to beat that game like with my eyes closed. Played it on the on the Switch in handheld mode, and just got just got it absolutely handed to me. So it was like, yeah, 
Okay, reactions are a bit slower nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you soon find that out, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna have to swat up on um on the old NES games again, but yeah, love the NES. I remember the magic of like um Super Mario Brothers Free coming out. Do you remember that? Yeah. And it was like, uh, do you remember the Wizard? Remember that Fred Savage? No, Fred Savage? no. It was like a, a, it was a movie. It was like a, a kids' movie, but it was literally like a Nintendo advert. The entire film was just like. Are you on about the Super Mario movie? No, no, oh, that's terrible. Is, <laughs> yeah, no, that, that was a real thing. Yeah, but, but <clears throat> there was like a, a movie hmm. with uh, I think um, yeah, is it Christian Slater was in it as well? All oh, right, I must have seen Fred it. Savage. You mustn't have seen it. The yeah. Wizard. It's like a yeah. It's definitely a product of its time. Yeah. But it was kind of paid for by Nintendo to get made. Oh, okay. Right? I need to have a look. So product, look product placement is all over the movie, and, and like everybody's playing Nintendo games all the way through. It. There's a big competition on, and right at the end, the, the game that they actually play hmm. is Super Mario Brothers 3. Right. But that movie came out like a year, probably a year, year and a half before that game ever came out. Hmm. So it was like just a massive promotional piece for 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 the game. Right. It's just phenomenal. But I remember the build up and I remember watching that film and looking forward to that game for like years. Well what seemed like years as a kid. Hmm. But you know, how often do you look forward to like really look forward to a game release these days? It's like you know, it sort of seems to not happen anymore for me. <clears throat> um yeah, I mean the first first time I saw footage for uh, Elden Ring, which yeah. is a brand new PC game, that one I was, and I bought yeah. that. Um, so I've been playing that. Um, that's hard as nails, but it's supposed to be. You know, that's yeah. I think that's. Uh... <clears throat> I'm still playing Sekiro. <laughs> oh, I forgot about that one. Yeah, that's yeah. one I want to play. Yeah, that yeah, definitely Sekiro's interests good. me. Yeah, Sekiro is good because it—you can tell it's like a Souls game, but it's it's um it's so different. The combat's so different because of the parry. No, I haven't. I've, well, I've deliberately not seen much footage of Elden Ring because I do want to get it and I do want to play it, oh, but I don't want to know anything about it. If you know what I mean, so yeah. I I avoid it on YouTube, like the plague. Did you ever play um, Hunchback? But the original. Yeah. Yeah, on the Amstrad. Well, I, w I would have played it on the, the spec. Eh? I, I imagine yeah, yeah, it was the yeah. same on the Amstrad. You know how difficult yeah. that was? Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. it's ten times as difficult. Than that. <laughs> 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 oh, mate, I've, Brilliant. it's it's one of these games, and you think oh, I'm not getting anywhere here, but you keep playing it. You get yeah. it's, 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 you you become you become um, like a glutton for punishment. Yeah, it, it amazes me with those games though, and, and Sekiro is the same. Because you start off and it's it seems unnaturally unfair, hmm. and and you kind of you well you know you died because you died and it was your fault, and then you go and you do it again. But it's amazing how good you get because of it, because of it, and that and then you and then you progress, and it's like um, and I remember this. I was playing Sekiro because I've, I've brought this laptop for the, the game development stuff and it's a decent machine. And so like my accessibility now to being able to just play a game has increased because it's a laptop that just sits there. I haven't got to go and trundle upstairs and turn everything on. And yeah. do you know what I mean? So it's like, it's just so easy now. Yeah. And I was sat here playing Sekiro and all of a sudden I just got good at it. And all of these sort of like mini bosses that were, that were destroying me. I just I went through a phase. I think I beat four bosses in a, in a night, which mm. is like crazy. And just remember having a newfound respect for the game. And uh, yeah, they're awesome, aren't they? Well, it's I, it's the old school on. way of playing, isn't it? Like yeah. repetitiveness, and then yeah. all of a sudden, oh god, I've I've done level one, like manic miner. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But. Uh, that's kind of missing now. And, it, and it's weird that those games like Elden Ring and, um, you know, Sekiro and the Dark Souls games, that is actually what people love about them as well, is that they're just hard as nails. Yeah. And it's like, well, 
<laughs> yeah. It's crazy. Because most people, if, if the, I don't know what it is, but most people would run them all from games like that, wouldn't they? Or just, just pan them and say, well, it's not very good. It's not very well balanced or it's, you know, it's that and the other. Yeah. But then, yeah, but you've got to put the errors in. And that's that's the key, isn't it? You've got to get good. But yeah, yeah, I'm still playing Sekiro. That's such a good game. You you would love that. I'm not sure how that weighs up to Elden Ring in terms of the combat, but um, yeah, Sekiro is such a good experience. I think I think I'd enjoy it purely because I know it's Japanese themed and um, yeah. Well, you play as a you, you play as a samurai, don't you? You play as a samurai. Yeah, it's 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 kind of. Um, well, you, you can see it's, it's almost like Tenchu in a way. I remember you can Tenchu. Play, you can play a bit like Tenchu, mm. but then when you're in combat, it's it's a beast, you know, and it's all about your timing of your your parry. Um, and, you know, you can't just stand there blocking because your, your posture meter's being sort of built up to the point that you're going to be staggered and then they're going to hit you anyway. So it's like you have to... Well, it goes into all that. Yeah. It's it's not well. It is deep, but it's it's kind of intuitive once you've sort of spent an hour on it. It's um it it, it hooks you, and then the because the the standard enemies like they are in any like Dark Souls game, probably the same for Elden Ring. They could just destroy you if you're not careful. Do you know what I mean? So you constant every battle means something. You've got to perform in every like encounter with an enemy, mm. but it's so well done. And it looks the part, you know, if you're saying, oh, well, I like it because it's Japanese themed, you do feel like this badass um, <laughs> samurai when you're cutting them down. And it's really good. It's really cool. And every, everything about it is top draw. Do you know what I mean? It's mm. like, it's just so good. But again, the game doesn't tell you what you're supposed to be doing. And, and like, you can get the lore for the game if you read all about the items and stuff, but there's so much text yeah. and to take in and that. But yeah phenomenal game Sekiro but I will try Elden Ring it's for me it's, it's having the time to invest in something else do you know what I mean that's that's my that's put me off a lot of experiences at the minute yeah I, I totally get that it's uh, yeah it's like what I'm doing with the YouTubing and and, and the, the podcasting yeah you start to lose time for actually playing games so what I do now is if I'm Twitch streaming and playing, I'll put the game on, I'll record it, yeah. and then I'll, I'll just collect all this footage. So, so if I need to go back to it at a later date, I've got it. <laughs> yeah. But I've been yeah, playing the game at the same time. Yeah, um, that's a good, good tactic. Yeah, it's, but yeah, it's weird, isn't it? Because you, you, like, I don't know if it's an age thing, but now I'm older. Hmm. When I play a game now, I'm, I'm more aware of how long i'm playing it for yeah or how long it would take to get into something you know so when yeah when you look at these new games that come out and you think oh it's like a, a 15 hour campaign or it's like 10 hours you know I, I kind of think yeah okay i could play that over a couple of weeks but um you know anything more than that and it's like oh, i don't know if i've got time and that that sort of puts me off i play actually... a lot of um of Rocket League, just because it's like oh, six minute, okay, yeah, 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 six minute matches, you know, just jump into one, yeah. Um, but I've been I'm playing sure. that for years, yeah. I don't know how some some people pull the moves off on that. No, it is crazy. Some I'm still, I'm, I mean, I'm decent, but I'm, I'm still trying to get up there. Still getting beat by ten year olds. <laughs> yeah, but it's weird though, because at the minute it's like. Um, they keep updating the game, and, and for some reason, their servers are just trash. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So, like, when you're in a game, you'll be playing really well, and then all of a sudden, your car's just getting pulled off to the side. Do you know what I mean? And, it, like, our internet in the UK, it's not that bad. And if I play any other game online, I've never had that experience. But um, this is physics-based yeah. network code and all the rest of it, and it must just be a nightmare to keep track of. But... Um, yeah, I'm normally scuppered by the uh, by the trash talkers when I get lag. Oh, blimey, yeah. That's the excuse for for losing every time. Ah, oh, it's just laggy. 
but yeah, no, I've I've got a bit of a love hate with Rocket League, mm. but I enjoy it. But I do find that that's like um, I don't know I don't know what your experience is of online playing with other people around the world, but it's the most toxic environment. I, I don't bother anymore. I uh, yeah. I stopped playing online. Um, well, that's a lie actually, but I'll, I'll get round to it. When it came to competitive play, I stopped playing after Quake 3, because I was a big right. Quake 3 player. But I preferred to play online with a group of mates. It's much yeah. more fun. There's, there's nothing better than shooting somebody with a rocket and then just standing up, peering over the monitor and looking <laughs> at their face, going, ah! You know what I mean? There's, there's nothing yeah, better yeah. than that. Um, yeah. You know, getting a couple of pizzas in, a few beers or energy drinks or whatever. Um you can't beat it, but yeah, I don't. I can't. I don't think I played anything competitive after that. Now, the game that I play a lot now is Elite Dangerous, my space sim. Now that's based online. Yeah. But because it's so massive, and there's so many different things to do in it: trading, um, exp- exploration. Um, and there is the combat element to it, but you can also play in groups or you can play solo as well, all in the same galaxy. Right. You still get a few toxic people in that, but if you're in a group. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Just call your mates. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's brilliant. It's, it's a little bit different to like the, because uh, my son was playing Fortnite for a while and I was I was wary of the, him playing that. Yeah, and any any time I'd hear him shouting, I'd be into his room going, "Calm down," you know, because I I didn't want him to turn into one of these toxic <laughs> kids that year. Yeah, yeah. So so I can imagine, I can only imagine what it's like on Rocket League. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it gets really bad. But they've t- they've turned the chat off now, which has helped because I'll the, the chat in Rocket yeah. League, the, the the actual voice chat, they turned it off because it. It never really worked very well. Yeah. But what was really funny was um, when I when I got was it when I got furloughed or just before the the pandemic, I actually wrote a soundboard, right? So just to play like funny clips down the microphone, <laughs> and uh, and that was really entertaining. So you'd oh, score a goal, and then yeah. you'd have like yeah. you know the theme tune to Enter the Jack the Dragon would kick off or something, oh, and they'd hear it, they'd be yeah. going mad. But I got that sick of like the toxicity online that mm. that was my answer to it, just to amuse myself. Yeah, I would play them, you know, that have Bruce Willis shouting at them or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they'd have some famous uh, film quotes from Jaws coming down their, their headset to them and yeah. stuff. And that really made me sort of chuckle. That, that entertained me for about three months. And then Rocket League, Sonics, they just took the voice chat out. So they couldn't hear it from that point. Yeah. But that was such a scream. Brilliant. But yeah. <laughs> so I think we better. I think we better uh, start talking about uh, some games you've been making, mate. Yes. Um, okay. So you've got quite quite a few games on Steam now, haven't you? Yeah, I've got a few um, on there. I'm not sure exactly how many. Let's just have a quick look. I think I've got like 10 games or 11 games. One, two, three, four, yeah. five, six. 11 games, yeah. Games. So I've got 11, 11 out on Steam. So how did that start? <laughs> so what happened there, um, it's all about the Amstrad. So okay. <laughs> I've got, I've got a, 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 failing, um, a failing floppy drive on the Amstrad. Right. Um, so it's just failing to, to, to load anything. So I brought a GoTech. Um, to replace it and obviously put the put the discs on. Played Chucky Egg mm. and just thought, you know what? I think I could. I, I bet you I could make this game because I've always wanted to make games and never done it. Okay. So I've never, you know, um, never done it because it was always. I wouldn't say too difficult, but it was like the time investment to get to get going would yeah. be like horrendous and then the costs involved back in the day and all the rest of it. And I was just playing Chucky Egg, testing this this device and thinking, well, yeah, you know, the, 
there's platforms that he stands on. There's there's ladders that he travels up and down. He can jump. The platforms move, and there's these you know hens that just move around the screen, mm. and it's quite basic. Yeah, you know what I mean. And it, and I just remember thinking this is something that's captivated me since I was a kid, and I still play it to this day. It's a good game. Let's just see if I can kind of recreate it. So. I went online. I was I was furloughed at the time, so we've got a lot of time as well. So time wasn't a problem, um, and I was really bored. And I and I just remember I, I watched a, a YouTube uh, tutorial on Unity, oh, which was like the the indie developers game engine of choice. Yeah. At the time, it was it was picking up notoriety for you know small indie develop developers and new starters mm. and stuff. And. Uh, it was, I just watched a player controller video and just thought, oh, that, you know, that, that all makes sense. Yeah. So then I downloaded a, a sprite sheet for Chucky Egg hmm. and just sort of um, loaded it all up into Unity and just got it got it moving. So, the, you know, the very first thing I did, I, I think it took probably about 30 minutes and I'd got, I'd got the character moving around and jumping and jumping on platforms. And it was like, well, real, realistically, you know, couple of ladders and a, a moving platform and an enemy and I, I have actually sort of you know I'm on there it looked terrible don't get me wrong you know what I mean it wasn't it wasn't good but it's like a little proof of concept and I think just just that idea of of putting half an hour in after watching I'd watched a lot more YouTube videos of course before that half an hour went on so I got a really good idea what to do but um you know just just that idea of picking up a joy pad and you moving it and and you know you're moving things around that you've done yourself and i kind of enjoyed it and and it, it just became gradually a hobby that you know i just got into and then before you know it you've almost got a game mm. so I, I proof of concept that that chucky egg thing and then um my daughter bryce said oh um you, you know he looks like a snowman and it was roughly you know, we've just gone through Christmas and a favourite thing to watch at Christmas is the snowman. Yeah, great. You know, the old Jones classic. Yeah, yeah, love it. And uh, so she, she said it looks like a snowman. So then I thought, should I turn it into a snowman? So that's what I did. And then it was all Christmas themed and, you know, and then just spent a few months just making levels for it. And then that that was the first game that got released. But it's, it's weird. It, it, the, the thing that amazes me with the game development is once once you start, you know, and you start adding things, you, it's like today, I've done, um, I'm working on another game now, hmm. and I've spent, just before we we started our chats, I spent probably an hour working out how to do, like, um, you know, simple things like joypad vibration. Oh, okay. Gotcha. You know, for, like, when, when you get hit and stuff. Yeah. And it's a simple thing to do. You've just got to have the time to just get and look at it and find out how to do it. It's not even like you need to be a really good programmer to do some of the stuff. Mm. You've just got to know what little chunks you need, yeah, where you need them sort of thing. So, yeah, so so, so I've got that working for like one joypad, and then I had to try and figure out, well, how am I going to do it if I've got a four-player game? So each joypad rumbles, you know, when that player gets it. Um, individually, so I just spent another half an hour on that, and before you know it, you know, this morning when I woke up, I didn't have any joypad rumble in any game, and now I've got it in this one, and you know, with the camera shake and all the rest of it that I programmed in today. But it's it's like these little wins, you know. You'll spend like an hour, and you'll put something else in, and then the next day you'll just do a little bit more, and then a couple of weeks you've actually got a game. It's it's just that's brilliant, and it. It, yeah, that that got me, and it, it's really addictive. Do you know what I mean? Just making a game, it's like, well, I'll just add this, I'll just add this. You kind of enjoy it, and then you play it. What is weird though is that you end up playing your game to death. <laughs> and well, then, yeah, testing it. Yeah. yeah, testing it, and then you, you like the fascinating thing about doing it all on your own is you've got no idea if it's any fun or not. You've got no idea. Mm. Because you you just numb to it, so you know yeah, you, you know you, you, it, it's it's really tough to gauge. So you don't know one if it's if it's fun, you don't know if it's difficult or not. 
Do you know what I mean? Because like you just played it to death. Your skill levels up there, and uh, yeah, it's just just uh, that's the problem I think with game dev. This you is just... this is why you need honest feedback, isn't it? Because that, yeah. that um, one of the games that I'm testing out at the moment for the uh, Specking X, um, I think the game was put to somebody else first. But they were just saying, yeah, 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 it's great. Yeah, yeah, it's good. That, that's no good. It's the worst thing to hear. That's no good. You, you, you've you've yeah. literally got to be... Um, scrutinise, you, isn't it? You've got to scrutinise it. You've got to, you've got to be brutally honest. And I think yeah. I'd, I think by the time I'd finished testing the first, I, I think I tested one level of this game. Um, I'd filled an A4 sheet of little yeah. changes I would make, because it, 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 there there are only suggestions, and um, they were all took on board, and they were like, "Yeah, that's brilliant." And then I did another A4 sheet, and that's it. I think if you're not honest, yeah, nothing um, changes. You, you know, there's there's a difference, as, as you know, there's a difference between just cr criticising and being constructive with, you know, constructive criticism. Um, you know, have you tried this? Do you like this? And you, mm. you, you might just think, no, nah, that's that's a bad idea. And here's the reason why. And then you think, oh, okay, fair enough. But somebody just saying, yeah, 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 that's really good. Or, no, nah, that's shit. That's... Yeah. The, the amazing thing is, is that you... You sort of because obviously as soon as I've registered a game on Steam, I can then generate keys and send it on to people, as you know. Yeah. And so, like friends, I'll send them the keys and say, right, let me know what you think. Yep. I need your feedback. Mm. And it's amazing, you know, none of them really do. They'll yeah. play it and go, yeah, yeah, that's really good. Yeah. And you because they don't like, want to, it's because they're your friends and they don't want to. Upset yeah, yeah. You. And yeah. I get that. I get that. There's but... one. There's one guy, uh, Craig, who, who I'll send it a key to and he'll do exactly what you've done and it's like so worth it mm. just to get his feedback yeah and there was like um so he played the latest game that, that i'd released he played that to death for me and he'd come back and he'd be like well you know if i was really trying to exploit the scoring system i could do this and i could just keep doing that and he's like oh okay so i need to put a, a work around it for that that's brilliant and, yeah and, and he, he'd be sort of doing that. He's done that for all the games. Yeah. And I know that as soon as I send him a key, I'm going to hear back, like, maybe 10 points, like you say, yeah. that I need to put in that I'm just unaware of because played it to death, don't even see the exploits and, um, mm. do you know what I mean? Or, or even that it's that it's crap. Do you know what I mean? Or that it's good. You don't, you just don't know. Mm. And it's so difficult. I... um. I play, played the game that I'm making now because it's going to be a four-player game, oh, right, and obviously okay. I, I I live alone, and so like when I have coded up all the four-player bits, but I've got nobody to test it with. So my brother come round. Yeah. We played the 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 game that I play single player, and it's just too easy hmm. with two players. So I've had to totally like, you know, readjust everything there. But that's something that if if I hadn't got that. Do you know what I mean? Like it's it's weird, but making a game, you just need other people. Yeah. You can't really do it on your own. You can do you can do all the coding and all of the, you know, making of the game. But in terms of making a good game, if you haven't got that feedback from other people, you, you're always going to sort of, well, you'll either be really lucky or just you'll fail at it because it's, you know, it's difficult. But I mean, I, all of the stuff that I've done so far, it's it's small. They're all kind of well. You, you can see it yourself. They're all inspired by retro games, anyway. Yeah. So there's the the first game I released, Snowman Saves Christmas. That's inspired heavily by Chucky Egg. Do you know what I mean? And, okay. And uh, even the first level, right up until probably a week, a week before that game released, the first level of that game was an exact replica of the first level of like Chucky Egg. All the ladders were in the same places. Right. Do you know what I mean? It, it yeah. was the prototype reskin, basically. Just to start you um, off. Just to start me off. Mm. So, like, in the end, I had to change it because I thought, oh, it's a bit too close. Um, but, like, this one, this Retro Wars is like, do you remember Who Dares Wins? Yeah. So, Retro Wars is uh, is a remake of that mm. because it's like, uh, that used to be my dad's favourite game. So, when I started doing these, these little projects as, like, it's like a hobby. That's all it is. Um, 
and I just thought, right, I'll remake all of the games that my family used to like, because at least then, if nothing else, my family are going to be able to sort of enjoy them, even if it's just for 10 minutes. Yeah. So I'd made um, I'd made that for my dad. Um, I've made, do you remember Mutant Monty? Do you remember that one? It's like, um, it's a weird control system because your, your character's got like momentum. Mm -hmm. So you move him and he just carries on to the end. A bit like a, a Pac-Man grid. I've got you. System. Yeah. But you, it speeds up if you hold the direction and that. So I made a game um, that was a complete clone of that. And then the, the young, the, well, my oldest daughter, Bryce, said, you, you know, um, you should you should turn him into a potato. <laughs> Just like these random things that come out of like a kid's mouth. Yeah. And then I did, I turned him into a potato and that was going to be the next game. That super hot potato. It's mad. It's all just like um, kids get the best ideas. They give you the best kids ideas. Get the best, yeah, kids get the best ideas. But that, that's all it is because I haven't got a clue. Like I'm working on a game now and I haven't got a clue what to call it. Hmm. But it's like an Asteroids um, inspired game. It, it's literally Asteroids. But uh, yeah, obviously I'm not going to call it Asteroids when it comes out. So no, I it's mean, a you got Blasteroids but, as well, haven't you? Which, which was yeah. one of the uh, later. Um, copies, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, it's a different. But I've, I've, got, I've not got a clue because I have a total brain freeze with stuff like this. So you've got no, no idea. It amazes me. Like when we when we were growing up, some of the names for the games were phenomenal. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, how did you get up, come, come up with that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when you've got to think of your own, it's like every idea you have is crap. And so, <laughs> like, I've got, uh, yeah. It's it's just really tough to come up with a name for a game, and then once you once you've named it and it's out, that's it. You know what I mean? You can't change it; it's done. Um, so I'm just yeah struggling with that. Mm. It's all the weird things you struggle with making a game. Yeah, it's not making making the games like not difficult. Even the coding, it's not really that difficult. But it's it's all of the other stuff. Like the one thing I'm terrible at is marketing. Okay. So I mean, I'm not I'm not um, I'm not really trying to make a living out of it it's like just just literally is you know for my own sort of sanity i guess and uh you just enjoy what you're doing yeah yeah keeps me out of trouble and all that sort of stuff and um yes yeah, it's, it's just so hard to sell games so like knowing the marketing side of it mm. would be you know probably the next thing that i need to like look at but yeah again it's the time investment you know that it's a full-time job for somebody isn't it marketing yeah, I, do know, you know, I, know, I, mean? I know a good YouTuber who can do some of that for you anyway. <laughs> yeah, 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 brilliant. But, but it's, um, yeah, it, it, it is, it's always things that aren't actually, um, you know, what you first think of that are the problems. It's it's like making a game's easy. It's just, you know, I, I always said to myself when I started, it's moving pictures around a screen. Do you know what I mean? And your screen's not getting any bigger as you're moving the stuff around. So, you know, Technically, it's not that difficult, is it? But um, if you see it in that sort of at that base level, you know, then you've got sound, and then you've got scores to track. If you're only like making retro inspired games, you know, you you sort of halfway there because most of the game design, you know, you just look literally carbon copying it and putting the new skin on, and you know, you might change the odd mechanic here and there. Um, so like. Yeah, so it's, it's not that difficult, so I wouldn't have thought. Do you design um, all the graphics and sound yourself? <laughs> yeah, that's why it's... Well, not, well, the sound, yes, but the music, no. Okay. So the, um, the the graphics, the first, the first probably, I don't know, well, everything other than the one that you've got behind you, it's all, it's all 2D. Yeah. Um, and then I started in at the end of November, beginning of December, looking at, looking at Blender. So looking oh, at 3D modeling, yeah. um, and there's a guy that that, that does a it does a YouTube channel, mm -hmm. and he does 10 minute modeling challenge because the the problem with learning Blender is mm. every tutorial you'll look at, you know, they're about an hour long, oh. and they're like really in depth. And that for me, as a bloke who you know, I could put that hour into just doing another 2D game. I've got you. So he's like really really off putting. Um, but I found this guy that does a 10 minute modeling challenge. 
And the best thing about it is he's really good at what he does, mm. but he'll call out while he's doing it really fast, the keyboard shortcuts that he's using to do different things. Oh, and once you've watched kind of, it was weird. I watched two of his videos and just knew what all the shortcuts were because he's constantly reeling them off. Wow. Okay. He's made new models. Yeah. So like all of a sudden, 3D modeling, like just basic uh, low polygon modeling. Just, just it was just easy, hmm. uh, and so then I made, you know, made the decision to make a space shooter, yeah. because you don't have to animate anything. You know, they they're just models, they're just static. You can rotate them in the engine, for for like the animation, and that's all you need to do. Oh, that's useful. So you haven't got to yeah. do the individual. So if you're banking like a, a spaceship, you haven't got to do yeah. the individual. So you just rotate the model. So it's in rather than it's sprite. In 3D space. Yeah. Yeah. So sprite, I would have to draw. You know, when you bank, you'd have to you'd have Jungle, to like cut yeah. a bit of the yeah. wing off and pull it in and all the rest of it on each frame. But yeah, so so doing it in 3D was it was quicker. So if you could make like it would take me probably an hour to draw a spaceship, it would look terrible for one. <laughs> Because I'm not not like an artist, and then you've got to do the other frames for the banking. Um, whereas in Blender, ten minutes you're done, and the entire thing. Then you know, if you've got the geometry right, it will all just cast shadows off the lighting. So you've got that other element of the lighting that's making it all look better. So it's kind of easier. It's it sounds like it shouldn't be, but it's just easier doing it with three D models. Um, if well. I'm not animating though at that point. So I guess when I come to do like characters, hmm. it's kind of going to be difficult because then I've got to get into the animation on, on the blender side. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just, just weird. But I think I'm going to start to do more shooter games for that reason. If that makes sense. So I'm yeah. just going to, just going to do more like I've got, um, I don't know if you can say, I've got a copy of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I brought that the other day. Uh, spent a few hours as well because laptops nowadays I've got loads of PS2s upstairs connected up to play it on but obviously that's upstairs so again I've got the laptop mm. and I figured well I'll put the PS2 emulator on it yeah um, and, and that's what I've been doing I've been sort of playing that for a bit of inspiration um, they're phenomenal games aren't they the space shooters um, well genre. Our, our type is probably um, the king of of side scrolling shoot 'em up stuff because I'm a big fan of shit of side scrollers myself. Um, yeah, R types definitely up there with um, UN Squadron, UN Squadron, um, Nemesis, Salamander. Um, yeah, oh, there's so many, but uh, Thunder Force Three on the Mega Drive, love that. Yeah, there's the Gradius games as well, isn't there? Yeah, there's yeah. all of that. So uh, I'm um, so I'm I'm thinking that the next one's going to be something like that, but I'm. I'm okay. probably at the point where, yeah, modeling the ships, the spaceships wouldn't be a problem. It's the backgrounds, so it, it's it's all the things that like you know you're not a, you're not an artist, and I'm not an artist. I've either got to get good at doing it, or then you know go on something like Fiverr and pay someone to make you know backgrounds and all the rest of it for the for the levels and stuff. And I, I've got no idea what that looks like financially. Um, um, but I think I'm almost there now, where where that's going to be the next step. I think I think sometimes it's it's all about just talking to people, and uh, yeah. sometimes you'll find find people out there who'll be like, "Oh, I'll do that for you," and they, they don't know money or anything like that. They, they're just yeah. happy to for you to to use their um, their, asset. ta their yeah. assets, their talent, and they get a shout out. And they're quite yeah. happy with that. Um, yeah. There's, there's, there's plenty of people out there. Mm. Um, it's like it's like the YouTube stuff. Um, I I have got my own music that because I used to do a load of um, Amiga stuff back in the day um, on trackers. Um, but it doesn't necessarily fit into the videos I produce. Yeah. So I'm just cheeky. I'm like, oh, can I use you? Can can I use this for my and they'll either say no or yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think, yeah. I, I, I think as you get yeah. older, you, you sort of be, become a little bit more ballsy about it. 
<laughs> yeah, I've got, I've got lucky with the music side of it because there's a guy at work um, who's really good at just knocking out music. And oh, he's so talented. There you go. So the, the music that's in the game behind you, he, he, I asked him if he would do something. Mm. He was like, well, what do you want? I said, I don't know, just maybe something with a bit of a techno vibe to it or whatever, space themed. Sent him a copy of the game. I said, just, just play that and see what you think. And probably within an hour, it sent me two tracks. He said, oh, what do you think to these? So, oh, brilliant. How long did that take you? Oh, half hour each. Can you do more? Yeah. <laughs> and then before you know it, you know, you've got like some good tunes to use in there. amazes me that people are that talented mm. that they can just bust these things out and it's like effortless yeah and i mean you know i got to the point where you know i'm not musically talented at all really and and i've brought like a keyboard and the next thing was right i'm gonna have to learn how to play the keyboard and it's amazing like all of these things that you that you you just you just kind of come to the the conclusion that you've just got to do something you just got to learn something else yeah. and that's the, that's the fascinating thing with it now if, if i wasn't making games i wouldn't be bothering to even buy a keyboard do you know what i mean but yeah. it's like it's such a big thing that you want to get this stuff in your game mm. but knowing people that do it is like yeah so I, i'm not i'm not learning the keyboard now <laughs> <laughs> but yeah yeah, it's mad. The, it is mad. There's a guy you, uh, I've, I've, I've become friends with, um, called Richard Faulkner, um, a man in his techno shed. That's his uh, his channel. Yeah. And and his his knowledge, um, with keyboards and music and stuff is is mind blowing, and he's writing game. He's writing music now for games, and uh, I, just the other day I was like. Fancy doing some music for some of my, for my channels? And he's like, oh, yeah, brilliant. <laughs> and so it was almost as though he was waiting for me to ask him. Yeah. But sometimes you, you're like, oh, sh surely he wouldn't want to spend time doing stuff for me. So I, I, I totally get that. But yeah. I think you, the, the last couple of years, I've, I've just started to think, you know what? All the, all, just, what's the worst that's going to happen? They're, gonna, they're just going to say no. Or look at you funny. Yeah, um, yeah. Or they might yeah. walk over the moon and think, oh, bloody hell, somebody wants to use my stuff. And uh, Yeah, well, well, I, I know how that feels because giving you the keys to give away yeah. to me was like, yeah, I don't care, have them. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it, it was like enjoyable for me to think, great, someone else is going to play it. And it's yeah. like, you know, I get a kick out of that as well, just other people trying it. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah. So it, I guess it is the same for musicians and artists and stuff. But um, yeah, I don't know. Making games, there's just so much to it. But all of the stuff that you need to do, you're not like, you know. I mean, I'm not a good artist, so a lot of the games that I've sort of cobbled together initially, they don't look great. But now I've started to see the benefit of doing the 3D modeling. Yeah, I think that's where I'm gonna sort of stick. I'll do more 2D stuff, but it's gonna be like smaller. Um projects in between other stuff I've, I've not built a big game out yet so it's kind of um everything sort of I've, I've got a cap of like i'll put three months into something i've got you and then yeah. and then i've got to release it because otherwise i'll be one of these guys who's making a game for four years do you know what i mean so it's like now I've, I'll, i only want to do something small relatively small it's like the game i'm working on now i thought oh i'm, I'm not there out in a week do you know what I mean? And I sort of did, but then I thought, oh, I'll make it four player. And then you do that, and then you think, oh, I've got to make arenas for it now because it's a four player versus game. So I did that. Then the play test, it's like, oh, it's too hard. So we've got to go and redo all of those arenas and, and change things and all the rest of it. 
And before you know it, you know, I've been on it now five weeks. So if it was a one week thing, it's now five weeks. And that's kind of like what happens. There's no end to it. So you have to just say, right, get the core game play done. And then, you know, bit of polish where you can. And then just release it. Mm. So, but the, the thing that's stopping me now is I haven't got a name for that game. So I can't register it. So, so two, two of two of your games that I've played. Um, yeah. So, Wings of World War Two, yeah, and um, the one behind Alien Space yeah. Bastards, um, which I'll I'll show some footage um, in with the. So what, what's what's this new game that that you're working on currently? Then? So, so the new game that I'm working on now, um, I've kind of already released this game in 2D. So so what I'm doing now that I've started doing Blender is mm. looking at my 2D games and thinking what what would that look like with 3D assets with in the 3D engine yeah. with all the real world lighting and all the rest of it on, you know, shadows cast everywhere and all that sort of stuff. Um, so so. I'd already made an Asteroids clone, right? right. Um, and so now I'm doing the same again, but this one's going to be different because it's 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 going to be a four-player game. Yeah. So you can you can it's like playing Asteroids co-op, but it's got kind of like did you ever play Sternwind? No. On the on the Dreamcast. So you know you like your um, side-scrolling space shooters. Hmm. Yeah. So on Sternwind, you've got three different coloured power-ups that come across when you blast the if you blast all five enemies, I think it is in a row in their formation. The last one drops, might drop a power up, um, and that you can change the color of the power up, like red, green, blue. I think it is right. Okay, and what it is is that when you pick that power up, up you then get the red weapon, right? But then if you get the red power up again on screen, you need to have your red weapon selected to pick it up to upgrade the weapon. Otherwise, that you. power up's just just thrown away. Um, so I've got that in there. So it's got the it's got the health and the weapon system from Sternwind, which is really cool because you've got it's then a color matching game as well. Um, I did think maybe I should put some like Ikaruga polarity Ikaruga in, in well, that's, there. That's a beast of a game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but I, I don't think there's like an Asteroids game with any of that in it. But then I thought, no, because they, you know, you've got to have things shooting at you. Then. So are the ast? Now here's, here's a question for you. So are the asteroids color coded to the weapon, so you can only no. destroy a particular asteroid with yeah. that weapon? Yeah. No, I thought about doing this, but what happens when when you get hit, hmm. whatever weapon you've got selected, it's gone, right? And when you've got no weapons, it's game over. So so you know, there's five weapons. Hmm. So you've got a potential five health. So you start with five. That was another thing that I changed today because it was like it was selecting you a random couple of weapons when you started. So each ship, they've all got their own stats on, you know, fire rates and fire speeds, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, and so like, yeah, so I couldn't color code the asteroids to the shot, knowing that the shot would be gone if you got hit. So it's kind of like a bad design choice really for the health i guess but um yeah i'm a bit too late in the game now to start changing that up but i, I could put elements of it in potentially so that the asteroids maybe the asteroids they've got cracks on them but i could have those cracks emit light and then you've got to you, you know and the light could change i guess so they could pulse different colors I got you. and only get destroyed that you know that's not a bad idea to be fair hmm. I have to credit you on the, um, <laughs> on the <logo. laughs> yeah.
game design. Oh, there you go. Mate. It's good ideas, mate. <laughs> Boom. But yeah, yeah. So, so I could actually, I could try that out pretty quickly, actually. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, if, if it was hit by a particular shot type at that particular time that that crack was a certain colour, yeah. Then it would, you know, or maybe even I don't know, have the asteroids have more health. Do you, do you know what I mean? And and yeah, yeah, you deplete them quicker if you match the colour. That could be a thing. That could actually be a thing. I'll work on that later. Oh, there you go. Then then you, then there, you there you go. But yeah, so so it's got it's asteroids. It's got this. Um, it's like a colour matching power up um, mechanic that it's mm. got to it, and also your health is related to the weapons that you've got on board at the time as well. Right. So it's like, um, yeah. So it's it's it, it's just a fun modern ish asteroids game at the minute. But so, all of it's been done. Yeah, sorry, carry on. I, I, so I was just going to say, so so can you choose between one player, two player, three player, four player? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So so at the moment, it's all very much um, sort of rough, as in like you just I've just thrown in a menu screen, I've thrown in a ship select screen. Do you know what I mean? It's not necessarily what it's going to look like. It looks all right, to be fair. It's just it's not. Not, not polished brilliant. yet. Yeah, not polished yet. But um, yeah. So we, so when you start a game, at the moment there's there's just the normal game and there's the the versus mode. Mm. So if you start the normal game, you go to the ship selection screen for one player, and then if you press start on the other joypads, those player selections come up, and they can pick their ship. Um, and then once everyone readies up, it'll then take you into the game. Um, and I've got different. Uh, yeah, different stats for each ship, um, and like your ship, your ship's got lights on it, and the lights like there's panels on it that, that are emitting light, I should say, and when you switch to that colour weapon, those panels change to that colour. Mm. So like I've tried to keep it so that although you've got your UI in the corner to show you what weapons you've got, just looking at your ship, you know, you should know what colour you've got selected. Um. So that's that, but yeah. So you can play co-op, which is which is pretty cool. But when I when I play tested it with my brother, it was just too easy. So I've had to re redo all the the um, the ship stats, so that you know you know you're not firing too quick. I've got you. And also I've, I've had to rebalance. So because um, it's all procedural, the the levels are like it never ends. So it's all procedural. Um, difficulty. Yeah. So I've had to rebalance that to say, right, if there's more than, if there's two players, double the amount of asteroids you're going to spawn by two for that level. I've got if you. there's three, yeah. it's times three. If there's four players, do you know what I mean? And then it, it kind of tracks how many players are left for the next level. So how have you how have you tested the multi-player part of it then? Um, because that must be quite yeah. difficult to, to if you haven't got four people. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it, it's kind of you, well. You, you can test everything, but the actual gameplay. So yeah. you can test that you know that player's ship will get destroyed when it gets hit. That it that it you know it's firing shots. It can move around the screen because you can just swap joy pads and use that one. But in terms of like having an actual play test, they're few and far between. You, so you've got to get four, literally four people together on Steam. Must yeah, be. yeah. So I've said to a few friends like uh, James, who you know, and uh, his brother-in-law Luke, um, my brother and another friend. You know, we need to get get around the living room yeah. and just play the game on a computer. Just four players. I've got four pads. Yeah. And just like if I can record some footage of them playing it as well. Also, it supports. It's going to support local play as well, then. Yeah. Well, at the minute, it's just well. With Steam, Steam do this um, remote remote play as well. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's what it's called, but you haven't got to actually code any um, online multiplayer in if it's going to be that kind of setup. So their server must run the game on the server and everyone connects into that. And it's like your joypad one, your joypad two in wherever you are and all the rest of it. So like you can you can do it that way. I've never I've never tested that but that's like one of the features of steam so you haven't got to do anything as a, as a developer you still need a you still need like a lobby though don't you i suppose no not well, well I, I think you send the invite through steam to your friends to join you 
right okay. on, on the remote play so it's not it's not even um you know it's not a programmatic challenge to so do, it, to do. So it must you have like like a virtual um yeah so, so it so looks right you're you're local you're not but you're local so yeah but, so you're virtually connecting yeah like it's, it's really cool actually because you haven't got to do any as a developer you haven't got to do anything so you you can do you can release your game i'm saying all of this i don't even know if it's any good <laughs> you know what I mean? It might be like really laggy and terrible. Yeah. Oh, well, but, you'll have to send me a beta, and I'll uh, I'll test it out for you. Yeah, well, we, we we could do it on uh, we could do it on Wings of World World War Two. Oh, right, okay. You know what I mean? Like if 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 we sort of friends on Steam, you can yeah. invite each other in to play with you. Right, okay. and the other person you invited would be player two. Mm. Um, so I think you can do that. That's that's how it works. But yeah, so so, so like it's going to be four players couch co-op oh. so whether that's using this remote play or not i've been looking at using um something called photon for multiplayer oh right what's so that it's like a well there is a free version of it i'm not sure what the ins and outs of the licensing are right but you can you know if you're a small indie developer hmm. um, i'm not even sure if i'm allowed to commercially release at this point i haven't really looked into it okay, but fair enough. photon is, is quite popular so you can spin up servers and use those and create lobbies and get the, the players to to join into the lobby. Um, and, and I think that the game runs on the actual server. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and you can, you can on your objects in the game that yeah. you're developing, you can sort of tag them up to be trackable by the server or, or whatever. So it's just a virtual machine, isn't it, though? Sounds like it. Mm. I haven't really. I've watched a couple of YouTube tutorials while I've been like brushing my teeth, as you do, <laughs> and, and all that sort of stuff. So it looks it looks easy enough to sort of do. Just following yeah. along with, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of work involved because you've got to make sure all of the objects are set up to be tracked by uh, Photon or whatever. But it looks easy enough. Mm. So. Uh, but again, what, what I seem to be doing is like, okay, I, I did that last time. I'll try this this time. But I'm just putting in like one new thing each time. Like this game, this next game is going to have like Joypad Rumble, which I haven't done before. It's easier to do in the newer versions of Unity because they've totally redone their input system. But I'm using the old legacy system and Joypad Rumble isn't part of it. So to get that working, I've had to put a plug in and use that. So, you know, I'll be better off using a newer version of Unity, but then they've changed the licensing. So if you want to then release on consoles, you've then got to have the pro Unity license on those bio versions. So like, there's all loads of like little intricate ins and outs yeah. to it all. Yeah. Um, mm. But yeah, so, so that's what I'm doing now. I'm doing like more, um, more joypad orientated stuff with the vibration and then uh, you know maybe for the next game I'll do like a, a proper multiplayer what, uh, um, version of the game what joypad are you making it compatible with or does it just pick pick up a free it just, it just picks them all up so I've got um, there's just a bog standard bluetooth that's that's a good joypad that's my rocket league that's that's the, the the joypad of a pro Rocket League player. There <laughs> is that what it is? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's just like um, <clears throat> that's like an Xbox controller, but yeah, that's that's all almost, about... almost like with a PlayStation layout. Yeah, because yeah. you got the thumb. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. With, with Unity is really good. Like the the game engines now, hmm. Unity as a game engine, it handles so much that you know you haven't got to code it. To, you haven't got to code it at that level where you've got to get a joypad working it's like the joypad just works but you've still got to map in what your buttons are do you know what i mean like there's some setup but it's it's not necessarily programming it's like just just understanding just how that how that ui works in the unity editor and then you you yeah. call well you you look for the button presses then in your code yeah. you know that it's that is coding but it's so easy yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there, there's nothing about it that's like somebody waving a magic wand. It's all easy enough. Do you know what I mean? It's it's yeah. simple stuff, really. It's just having the time to go through. Right. Well, how does that work? And and all the rest of it. I mean, I've got um, 
I've got books on Amstrad programming because I oh, wow. my, my my end goal after I've done you know a bit more on Steam and uh, and on mobile is to, is to go back and do a proper you know Amstrad variant of one of my games. I think and that, so important. I think that'd but be that, pretty awesome because eight eight yeah. bit games at the moment. Well, not just eight bit games, but old old systems. Um, I don't think there's one old system that I can think of that hasn't or isn't getting a brand new game for it now. There's so it, it's just come alive. Yeah. Um, especially the sp- Spectrum scene definitely has. Um, yeah. There's brand new Commodore 64 games coming out. Um, as far as I know, Amstrad, uh, MSX. You remember the MSX? That's yeah. getting new games. The Amiga's well, getting new games. You know, it's just on and on and on. Yeah, yeah. And, and do you know do you know do you know why I think that's getting a resurgence as well? Is because it it's like it's really difficult to do. Do you know what I mean? It's what what I'm doing, you know, isn't particularly difficult to do. Hmm. But going back to you know the old school basic programming, yeah, it's like a totally different skill set. It's it's like there's so many factors memory's not there like i can just abuse memory all day in unity yeah and just assume that there's memory to be had no, there's loads of but restrictions with, with there's the loads of restrictions yeah. yeah you've you've basically got a piece of hardware there that you're writing your game to run on mm. and most people probably start thinking of a game and you know what amazes me about that that era and those programmers is they knew that they could get those things working on that hardware and a lot of it, you know, that hardware was never scoped to do. No, absolutely not. Never designed to do it. I mean, the the Commodore 64 running Sonic the Hedgehog yeah. is like a new it's one. Insane. And you're like, bloody hell. Mm. How the hell do they do that? Like, what magic? Yeah. So Some of the um, some of the, the Spectrum 1 to 8K games coming out now, you, you see the how smooth the... Because the spec it was, always, it, it was always a problem with scrolling. It always because just didn't have the hardware to do it, so yeah. nine times out of ten they they get a six, especially if they were they were comparing it to a sixty four game, where you got nice smooth scrolling, then you'd have the spectrum conversion and it'd be flip screen to get round it, but some of the scrolling now on some of the games is mind blowing. It's like how the hell yeah. have you done that? Yeah, it's it's almost un- unrecognizable that it's a spectrum running it, isn't it? Yeah. To a point. Whereas the Amstrad, know, not, was, not, not the Amstrad was in the middle, whereas it had, it really had the best of both worlds. Yeah. Because um, I think it had already got the, the Yamaha chip similar to the to the Speco, but it had also got, it hadn't got the muddiness of the sixty four, it hadn't got the color clash of the Speco. It was in the middle. It, it had had nice sprites and you had a nice color palette, didn't you? Yeah. Um, but I think it was just down to popularity. Whereas really, yeah. the, the Amstrad was, yeah, it was a great machine. Yeah, I, f- I think the thing, the thing when I when I think of the Amstrad games, and especially now, because you can look back now and totally understand. Like back then, we wouldn't have had a clue about the tech. Mm. Do you know okay. what I mean? All the limitations, all the all the modes, or any of that stuff. No. But when when I look back at the Amstrad library, it's like. It's so clear, though, that a lot a lot of the games that come out on the Amstrad were just ports of Spectrum. They were, and if you didn't and, and, have if you didn't have a, you know a decent programmer porting the game yeah. or rewriting it, then you were just getting second class games, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. and 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 that was a big problem with the Amstrad because those games are probably legitimately you know improved on the on the spectrum yeah because that's that's the original machine yeah but like having them on on the amstrad it always just seemed like there was something missing on an amstrad game yeah that wasn't you know specifically coded for the amstrad yeah. if that makes sense yeah um which was a shame because he, he, you know well for the time it was a very capable machine but then you know, you've got to look at the stuff that these people are doing nowadays with these up the the old hardware and thinking, bloody hell, yeah. the stuff that it could do anyway. Yeah. You know. I haven't done much um, like research because I, I haven't got an Amstrad, so it's not something that I would look 
really look into but it, it's certainly an area um i would like to get into I'd get, get myself an amstrad nice monitor yeah um because well, I, I know it's a decent machine yeah I, i've written a good front end for 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 the emulator for win oh okay um, just to manage my own games hmm. it's nothing nothing like crazy it's just yeah. like a windows form based but it sends in the instruction to load your ROM and all the rest of it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I can, I can share that with you if you want it on uh, Dropbox. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. My and introduction then you, uh, to Amstrad. Yeah, your introduction to Amstrad. And just, just pick a few of your favourite games out and just have a bash. Even compare the spectrum then. Yeah. 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 Be... And you, you can see the, the sort of um, the thing that I'm talking about where it, it's probably 100% going to play better mm. on your spectrum, even though the so... Amstrad. You know, you know. A, a friend of mine had uh, had an Amstrad, um, and we used to go around, you know, around his house, and uh, we'd, we'd still play on it. But because it was a green screen, it was like, oh, this is rubbish. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, you know what you're like yeah. when you're a kid. There's, yeah, there's, yeah. There's, there's no, there's no other description. Is it? It's like that's on a green screen. It's rubbish, and that's yeah. and, that, and that yeah. and that was your review, wasn't it? Yeah, it's better. Yeah, on, yeah. It's better on the spec. Eh? It's better on the sixty-four, um, and and that was it. I mean, I was always taught, even though I was a, I had species, so obviously I was a Spectrum fan. My cousin had the Commodore sixty-four, um, but for me, the the sound chip on the sixty-four uh, was just somebody else, absolutely somebody else. That SID chip. I mean, I yeah. I still listen to pure SID now. Um, my wife thinks it's uh, torture. She just <laughs> doesn't get it, and, and and I get why some people don't get it. But for me, yeah, um, it transports you back though as well oh, instantly. It, it does, mate. It does. The bitmap brothers and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's like yeah, yeah, yeah. Mate. yeah it's it, well, it is. It, it's the nostalgia again, isn't it? It's so powerful. Mm. Like we see it all totally differently. But it was the intros as well for for me with the. You know, you'd load up a 64 game and it was a copy and it was cracked by somebody. And you just load it up for that crack screen with a scroller because the music was so amazing, like like some of the yeah. older ocean loaders. Yeah. You wouldn't even play the game. You just, no, just you, leave the music just playing. Leave, I just used to leave the music playing, yeah. And I used to do exactly the same with, uh, with the Amiga. I'd spend a whole night just playing demos, just yeah. looking at the graphics, Listening to the music and that'd be it. Wouldn't even play the games. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't know. I mean, I imagine the Amstrad had a, a demo scene, but but I've known nothing about it. It's well, the the the, the bootloaders for the hacks that you mentioned. There, they're on there. There's the there's a few on the um on the disc images that I've got, like for the emulator. Mm. Like it, it, it is that scene it's it's the same stuff and it sounds decent yeah. but i'm not i'm not experienced enough of it on like the commodore scene or the spectrum scene to be able to weigh them up against each other but i know exactly what you mean about like the music quality and the production value of just that that screen to say well do you want infinite lives because that that's what it all is isn't it it's like yeah. do you want to just start the game normal or do you want infinite lives yeah the little trainers is that it? used to put on yeah 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 yeah. and uh i know exactly what you're saying mm. because they're some of them are, 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 are like more impressive than the game you're loading aren't they oh god the demos were yeah they were, they, they were yeah. you'd look at the programmers and you'd be like you know you'd look at these demos you're like why aren't you making games how are you doing yeah. that on my screen yeah. it's amazing yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's phenomenal. It looks like geometry everywhere, doesn't it? Like shapes Incredible. moving around and stuff. But yeah, they're yeah, phenomenal. <laughs> Welcome to Treasure Island.
roads lead back to the Amstrad for me. Yeah. So every everything I've done like with the game development stuff, it's all either based around like an Amstrad game that I used to play on or a family member I used to play or you know, it's it's that era. There's there's a game from that era that the yeah. like been sort of used as inspiration. I think that's really exciting. If if you're gonna go back 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 to programming stuff uh on the Amstrad or I, I really do because there's a there's a massive scene for that. Yeah. Really is. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the Spectrum Next. Um, the good thing is with that because you can, because it's an FPGA and you can change the core. Um, I don't know if anybody's wrote an Amstrad core for it yet, but in theory, you can just reflash um, the the chip, and it'll, t- yeah. it'll turn it into an Amstrad, and then. You know, you could you just run your games as normal then on mm. that on that machine. In the hardware, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's going to take a while for it to be fully. Re- I don't know if you've looked at Spectrum Next at all. I mean, I've, I've, shown I've, it seen, I've seen, it, seen it briefly, but I haven't like really delved into it. Yeah. But it looks a capable bit of kit. It is that. I mean, they tried to they tried to update it in a way that it was the next Spectrum, rather yeah. than putting loads of modern hardware on there i mean they could have easily have put um you know dma memory on there and um usb slots and they they could have they could have done all that if they wanted to but they 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 went for the fpga because they can they can they can program it to whatever they want want to do with it um i think they've the most modern bit of tech on there really is probably um it's got a ras you can have a raspberry pi zero daughter board slotted on and you can use that well what they're using it for at the moment is so it can grab a um dot tap file yeah and it basically turns it into a, like a virtual tape machine so it will convert it to audio and then yeah. play it back to the next as though it's loading up an old tape, um, tape with a yeah. tape deck. So that's all they've they've really done with that at the moment. That's and, cool, though. Yeah, and, and it's got a HDMI slot on it, and that's it. Yeah. Whereas everything else, really, it's... Because uh, you, can, you can plug your old interfaces in there that you used to have in the back. I think it supports all the old micro drives. Um... The joystick ports are Kempston, so they're still nine pin. So they've yeah. they've, they've tried to keep it as as retro as as original as as it, as it can be. Yeah, yeah. That's really cool. Mm. That is really cool. I, I I do. What fascinates me about that scene as well is how you know how available things are still. Like you can still buy joysticks and joy pads and stuff. And there's um there's even like new peripherals yeah. people making still it. being yeah. made mm-hmm. yeah yeah and it is phenomenal but then like fast forward 20 years 30 years when we're sort of not in the scene anymore or whatever I don't know about well that. We're, we're probably <laughs> well you're not you're not as old isn't it? But, um, but you know what i mean like that the younger generations growing up mm-hmm. are they going to be appreciating where it all started yeah or are they just going to think oh have you seen the graphics for the next call of duty it's crap do you know what I mean? It's like the kids nowadays. It's the classic, isn't it? They haven't felt our pain of like deciding what game you're going to want to play and then waiting for ten minutes for it to load. But when we were kids, because we didn't know anything better. Yeah, we didn't know. Yeah, didn't know, you know, you 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 press play to play on. Time. You accepted. You you're accepted it. Yeah, you'd have your tea, come back upstairs, and you get oh, tight load error, great. <laughs> yeah, that was the, that again. was the biggest pain. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it's quite funny actually because I've got a, I've, I've still got a tape deck plugged into my, uh, into my Specky Necks, <laughs> um, and I've still got my my screwdrivers. <laughs> hey, there to, they are. To adjust the ends, you know, Love because it. still to this day you'll get one game that will not yeah. load. Um, yeah. I'm knocking everything off now, so. Uh, yeah, I, I still yeah. love it. I still love it. But I think, like what you said with your, with your daughter showing her the Amstrad, I think that's what's important. 
Um, mm. That's why I try and get my son involved as much as possible with all the retro stuff. So yeah. he so he can gauge what we had. Where it all started. Yeah, and plus I think it's just more interesting because it's yeah. all mechanical and there's moving parts. And whereas yeah. now it's just I don't know how you feel about the digital world, but for me, I still love the physical games. Yeah, I love the, I love the box, the artwork. The manual, and you're getting something for your money. Yeah, I've, I'm. I'm a big collector. I mean, I, the, the um, remember the Wii U? Did you ever get that? I've got one sat over there. <laughs> yeah, of course so, I have. So the, the, Wii, the Wii U, yeah. the Wii U is probably the last console that I really loved. Brilliant machine. Right. Yeah, and and totally underappreciated because of poor marketing and all oh, the rest of it. It was horrific. Yeah, but. You know, I went mad because I because I knew it was a failing console, even though I loved it. I knew it was even from when I brought it. I thought nobody's going to buy this. This is failing. And so what I did was I went out and brought every game that was ever released for it. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. I'm, well, I say every game. I'm I'm Most ten of games off. Okay. I'm ten games off getting a full UK. You know, essentially a ROM set, but the Which physical ones do you disc. Need? Cause I've, I've got a few over there that I don't even want. It's a, <laughs> it's all the silly ones, like you know, the Barbie and and all the really like on obscure kitty ones. <laughs> the, only re the only reason why I say it is because I've got some of these that I've just ended up with. Oh, okay. I've got two copies of Zombie You. I'm guessing you've got that one. I've got that, yeah. 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 Um, but I've got. Marvel superheroes. Have you got that one? Yeah, got it. So, got yeah. it. Yeah. The, the thing with buying all of these as well, I, I went and brought them all brand new when they released. Yeah. So it was like every release that came out, I was always buying. That one. Really expensive time for me. Yeah, got it. Yeah. So, <laughs> so there probably isn't going to be any rare ones here. They're, they're just ones I ended up with. Lego Movie. Yeah, got it. Yeah. It's 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 things like Barbie and things yeah, like um, you know things that you would never walk into a shop and buy anyway. Try, try to give up the uh, the Barbie games. Yeah, I mean that they? one's still sealed. Have you got that? Yeah, I got it. I got the special edition of that as well. So it, yeah, it seems like uh, Batman Three. Got that one? Yeah, I got that one. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, but um, so so yeah, I'm a big collector. Yeah. But you know. I pref I much prefer having the physical stuff, Definitely. but the problem I've got with with optical media, especially hmm. anything with a laser in it, you know what I mean? It's it's just not going to last. No, the uh, the Dreamcast was um, a good one for that, wasn't it? Of uh, the lasers dying yeah. on that all the time. Yeah, but, you but can the, get the, the parts. good thing, yeah, the yeah. good thing is you can get the parts, and, and the even better thing is that you know most people that appreciate those systems who are like our generation now, mm. they're the ones that are going away and thinking, okay, well, what could we use to replace that laser drive? And then, you you know, you've got SD card loaders that you can just replace it with, just a straight out swap. Yeah. Um, and there's all of that stuff going on. And that's, that's really impressive. Like that's the really impressive thing about the retro scene. Although it's not keeping the original hardware exactly as it was, you know, appreciating that eventually it's gonna it's gonna you know fail the optical drive and there's options for people you can either spend whatever you need to spend to get a new drive or fix it or you know replace it with a different option that's probably more viable nowadays than collecting mm. cds because yeah. it's the cost of the games is ridiculous mm. and that's the other off-putting thing i was lucky enough to start collecting when i did because now Oh, it's impossible now. Yeah. yeah. It's like ridiculous. I've, then I've, you think, well, yeah. I've pretty much stopped collecting now. Um, I tend to buy new retro games now than, than old stuff. Um, yeah, it's 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 insane. I don't know if you've ever been to... Um, have you been to Vintage Gamer yet? No, I haven't been yet. Yeah. I've got to go. Because it's very local. Yeah. Local. It's even local, more local to me. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the guy you, uh, who owns that shop, Nick, 
the good thing is with him, he um, he'll beat any eBay price or CEX price. So, uh, but it, but it is an Aladdin's cave in there. You, you'd love it, mate. Yeah. I wouldn't. Yeah. I wouldn't. I wouldn't take your credit cards with you. <laughs> no, that's the problem. <laughs> well, this is the thing. You know, the nostalgia is such a good. Like, well, it's it's it's, it's a good and bad thing, isn't it? Because it will drive you to buy things. Yeah. And, I, and I'm the same. I've sort of gone mad buying stuff. And I've kind of had to rein it in now and say to myself, right, well, a lot of uncertainty in the world. You don't know what's going to happen with the job, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, yeah. just curb it a little bit because the, the security is not there, is it? So no. No. that would be a dream and a nightmare going to that shop for me. Oh. <laughs> because I think I think I would, you know, spend money. Yeah. And that's the problem. I'm almost glad I haven't got. I've, I'm, well, yeah, I'm almost glad I've run out of space in here. <laughs> because yeah. there, there is still a, f- a few things that I want. Um, yeah. As I say, I want I want an Amstrad set up. I'd like that. Um, I've always wanted um, a BBC because that was the first. That was that was probably my first introduction to computers. That was uh, yeah. having it wheeled in on a little trolley at primary school. At the school, yeah. yeah. Um, and just playing a maths program or Granny's Garden or whatever it was called, and it was like, oh man, look at this, it's amazing. Um, so yeah, th- there's that. I'd I'd love a, I'd love a Neo Geo, but that's never going to happen. Too much money. Yeah, they they cost a fortune. Yeah, and a friend of mine's Doom. got two of the damn things. <laughs> has he, what, what's he got? Has he got the cabinets or has he got like the proper? No, he's got the form a, 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 AES system. Is it AGS AES yeah. system? Yeah, AES. Yes. But 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 it is literally an arcade machine in your home with you know the cartridges are that big. Yeah. Um, great machine, and you, and you, you they, get an arcade stick with it as well. Yeah, they were so ahead of the time, weren't they? Oh God, yeah. Like back in the day, wasn't it like about six hundred pound a cartridge though? Yeah, it was it, something it, it, ridiculous. Yeah, yeah so even back then. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and it was a lot of money back then. Six hundred pounds was a, a lot more than it is now. But it was because you were buying a, you were literally buying an a arcade machine. You weren't just yeah. bought, you weren't just buying a, a console like the SNES Game. or Mega Drive, and having a c- conversion. You you were getting that that machine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they were phenomenal. So, you, I saw on uh, on, I think it was on Facebook, um, you posted some pictures of a game that you was working on, and there was like a little ninja. Yeah. Is there anything you can? Oh yeah. Tell us about that. Is that is that is that another secret project or? <laughs> yeah. or some well, other idea. There's 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 a game. I've I've already sort of mentioned this game. Funnily enough. Okay. But I was I was playing on the Switch on the NES, hmm. and it came out in this country as Blue Shadow. Right, and it's my favourite nin- ninja game. Okay. And it's know. it's not known as Blue Shadow everywhere else in the world. I think it's Shadow of the Ninja. Or okay. Sh- yeah, something like that. Is it anything to do with Shinobi or? No, but it's 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 that that it's a similar type of game. Yeah. But it's it's not Shinobi, but um, it's it's a side side scrolling, um, you know, slash them up, I guess. But. Really love that game growing up, like a lot of nostalgia for it, you know, hold it in as much regard as like the Batman game on the NES, you know, it was that enjoyable for me to play as a kid. And I thought it's a bit like Ninja Gaiden as yeah. well. Yeah. And so I thought, what if I do um, like a Ninja Gaiden style stroke Blue Shadow kind of game? Yeah. Where the Because the ninja in Ninja Gaiden, he, yeah, he could wall jump. But other than that, you know, and throw shurikens, mm. I don't think he could do much else. He could he could jump up walls and he could climb up certain walls. But then I thought, well, in Blue Shadow, you could kind of grab onto like a bar and lift yourself up and you could drop down a bit like you could on, um, was it uh, Shadow Ninja? Shadow Ninja, yeah. You could Shadow, that you could, Shadow Warrior. Shadow, Shadow Warrior. And you could yeah. shimmy across the bar at the bottom. Yes. So in Blue Shadow, you could do all of that as well. And so I thought, well, again, as another like little proof of concept tech demo, I'll just, just get the ninja moving. So that's that's what that that footage was. But it, 
was like I did it as like a programming challenge because for my first game the character controller was actually like not even my code so it was like just starting out to get it going you know watching a brackish tutorial and he obviously puts the link to the code just grabbed all of that and threw it in for the proof of concept hmm. just get that code to move in well with the ninja one i completely coded that movement myself so it was like just a programming challenge to get it done yeah um and then obviously dealing with different colliders for grabbing walls and all the rest of it and shimmying up and all that sort of stuff so it probably is coming but not yet <laughs> So this is one where we talked about like Blender and 3D modeling. And obviously if I've got to model characters and animate them, that's like another challenge, something else to learn. Yeah. So once I've got that under my belt, I might go back and do like a Ninja Gaiden stroke blue shadow game. Yeah. It's all about the graphics rather than the coding. It's about can you make make it look like what you envision it it's gonna look like. If it makes sense. Mm. And at the minute, I haven't got the skills to pull it off. So it's kind of parked. Not, uh, a lot of a lot of the stuff that I've, I've sort of proof of concept, I'll do knowing I haven't got the skill to sort of do it, but I could program it, if that makes sense. Yeah. So if I had an artist do the other stuff, it, it would happen. Um, but it's, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's, it's there, it's on the hard drive. Okay. Yeah, so I could boot it up and start working on it, but I'm I'm not going to yet. Because straight away, I, I thought uh, of the Bruce Lee game I did. Yeah, a few people have said that mm. Bruce Lee could be the next Bruce Lee game, but I'm. I have thought about doing a, a two D a stylized two D game that's using a similar control system to what that ninja's got, but not being a ninja and more being a guy with a gun. And doing like a, a 2D shoot platform shooter, maybe, mm. with elements of almost Bruce Lee in it, okay. potentially. Yeah. But then when I think about it, I struggle to think how it would actually work. But um, yeah. So I'm quite liking the the game I'm working on now. It's got like a neon look to it. There's a lot of like glowing lights and stuff. Probably gone a bit over the top on post processing and things like. That. <laughs> And they are. Yeah, but we it's could such always a make simple... it cyberpunky. Yeah, could do. But it, yeah. it's such a simple thing to do that you like you over you overdo it all. Mm. And I've I mean I've gone to town on it on the new one because it's like really bright. Yeah. And if I play it with the lights off, it's like it's burning your eyes. It's that bright. <laughs> but um <laughs> Yeah. So so I could I could do that and do a stylized graphics thing. The thing that scares me the most about the game dev stuff is is actually, you know, what it's going to turn out looking like because if you're not an artist it's it's just difficult because anyone could move a square around a screen do you know what i mean and essentially that's all it is mm. it's just you know if you if you strip it all back to collider boxes and that and that sort of thing you, you're moving squares around uh, it's just you know you your players not seeing the square they're seeing the sprite so it's kind of you know anyone could code but the, the real magic of games is how it looks, I guess. Because again, this is the amazing thing with like the old school programmers, what they had to work with and how they got the games looking the way they got them looking. And they, they were all bedroom programmers as well. Yeah, yeah. But a lot of the porting as well was like one guy. Yeah. Just And, and uh, I, th I think I, re I read somewhere about the guy that did the Amstrad port for the Turtles game. But he never even played the arcade machine or something. It was something ridiculous like that. Mm. Or, he, or he'd only had like an hour's exposure to the cabinet or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Some like to totally nonsense 
thing that I'd read. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I remember at the time thinking that's like tremendous that they've managed to pull that off. Yeah, it's like it's also ridiculous that they were put in that position that they've got to pull it off. You'd expect them to have the arcade machine next year. Yeah, not there. Yeah, not there to play on, but no. Yeah, and hearing things like that is amazing. Mm. I know the guy that did um, Chucky Egg was saying in, in in one of his interviews that he wanted to go much further with that game and and like because he developed the game he was doing it um i don't know if he was doing it after school or whatever but he because he was developing it he could just completely swap that game he would like play it forever it wouldn't kill him it was like too easy for him yeah. and so what he wanted to do was like move the ladders as you progress through the or take ladders away. So if you got used to playing it at a pattern, that pattern just wouldn't be accessible because the levels changed. Because I think I think there were like nine levels mm. or something that just kept sort of repeating. But obviously you got the big hen flying around at you and stuff. Gotcha. But it was the publisher that pushed him to release it. So they were screaming at him to get it done. Mm. And in the end, you know, that's what they had to do. But it's amazing. They're still, even with people pressing the, pressing the developer to like get the game out, they still manage to like produce what they produced mm. in the time they produced it. It's it's mind blowing. Yeah. <laughs> with the constraints of the systems they were using as well at the time. Yeah. And I've got to say, I mean, I've I've looked through the Amstrad programming book, and it is a steep difficulty curve. I'm sure you'll get there, mate. No, I will, but you've got to take your hat off to the guys that are doing it because it's like, you know, they're the real programmers. There's so much now that, that the engines do for you and that, you know, and these guys, that when they turn an Amstrad on, they see exactly what we see. They see a little flashing, flashing cursor, like that's it. And now you get from that to like, you know, an R-type clone or whatever. It's That is an amazing feat, isn't it, really? It is, and this is what amazes me with, you know, a lot of the, if, if you look at a lot of the modern gaming companies now, and they're using, let's say, like Unreal Engine. Yeah. So it's going to take a lot of the hard work out of uh, producing the game. And what amazes me is they release these games, and nine times out of ten, they're broken from these, trip, you know, these AAA yeah. um, companies. Because you know that that the shareholders and there's just somebody just, you know, not on the, the door going, on. I want my money. Come on, release the game. Release the game. Yeah. It's not finished yet. No, just release the game. Don't care. We'll patch it later. And that is just... But for us, the ones who spend spend the money on the games and then we load it up and we start, what the hell's going on here? Why doesn't it work? Why doesn't it even yeah. install? What's going on? Yeah. Um, they don't care, do they? No. They do not care. Yeah. But, you know, when we used to buy cartridges or, or tapes or whatever, there was no patches. No, no. Yeah, well, well, the problem is now the internet is like an easy way out, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. They can just they can just send it down. Oh, I just send the update down. I mean, I've done it. I've I've released games and uh, you know, <clears throat> they're not, they're not particularly broken. But then you, when you play it yourself and you realize, oh god, there's that happening. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, I didn't see that for weeks and now it's happening. The difference but then is you're, you're one guy on your own. That's the difference. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I get what you're saying. But, yeah, um, yeah it, it's, it's it's just it's just really bad how, how it's gone culture-wise that that's like acceptable now though. You know, because back in the day, if you brought a tape from, you know, your local star shop, mm, that, was, shop, that yeah. was the version of the game you had. Forever. That's it makes it. you wonder who does the play testing for these games. It really does. And the thing is, they even they even do alpha tests, beta tests, so people play them. Yeah. And then they still release it, and it's still broken. I think I think the prob problem is the scope of the games, though, as well. Because if you look at, I know there's you, a lot you, going on. I, I, I yeah, yeah. But if you look at like Elden Ring, you know, you're you're going to be playing that now. And if you think about how many hours that game potentially has got in, in it, oh, gameplay-wise, you know, and how do you expect a tester to to test everything? It's like, well, they've got to be re ridiculously good at that game 
and be able to test it. Mm. It's like, I guess, I, I don't know. I don't even know where you would begin at that level of like production but surely, to test it. But you would, you would surely think that they get a group of well, cyber gamers, is, proper gamers. Yeah. To try it. And I think that's what it is. It's the fact yeah. that they, they, I don't know if they employ people who, you know, do you want to be a games tester? Yeah, yeah, yeah I want to do that. Sounds like an easy job. Just sit there playing games all day. But it's back to that. It's not just playing the game. It's no, finding it's out what's wrong with it. Does it play right? Um, yeah. And I think that's where they go wrong. They're just employ if If they are employing people to test these games, that's all they're doing. They're just testing it, but they're not giving them the right feedback. Maybe, maybe it's because they're scared of losing the job. Mm. Of saying, "Look, it this is be. broke." It could be. I mean, Cyberpunk's a weird example, isn't it? Because everyone knew that was broke. Um, even even the people working on it, they knew that it was broke, but they were just forced to release. The thing is, with Cyberpunk, um, I mean, I pre I pre ordered Cyberpunk. I've, I've, I've waited for that one for years. Um, PC wise, when it came out, I couldn't see what the problem was. I was playing it. There wasn't. A, yeah, there was some. There was some bugs in it, but they were funny bugs. They were yeah, really yeah. funny. I mean, what, yeah. I, I mean, two that come to mind. Where I remember, I, I was I was travelling around one of the streets. I got out, I got out my. No, I was on my bike. <laughs> um, and I got off my bike, and then for some reason, a car had spawned on top of my bike. And then the, 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 the bike was like morphing with a car and yeah. then the car blew up and killed me. <laughs> right. So that was that was that was hilarious. And then there was another one where I, I walked into this street, I got, got one of my weapons out ready to start with this gunfight, and this truck from nowhere <laughs> came off this bridge, um, shot off the road landed into where this gang was and blew them all up and i was like oh, okay I ain't gonna do nothing now. put but, the gun away but but that was a to me that even though that was a that was a bug that wasn't game breaking that was just hilarious yeah um yeah but but i do know that the the console owners weren't they having they like had, they had a bad experience and, they? And, and all sorts of stuff they had all sorts of problems, didn't they? I mean, that's that's a common bug, to be fair, is, is the game saves disappearing. You hear about that a lot on some of these games. Oh, that's nasty, isn't it? That's a nasty one, especially if it's like a massive game and they've already sunk 20 hours in. The thing is, it was it should have never, ever re been released for that generation of console. Because at the end of the day, this game had, had been in development for years so you yeah. have to look at that technology back then. So those consoles were probably ready when they were released, but by the time it came out, technology had changed, PC hardware had moved on. There was no way it was going to run on those machines. No. Not not in a million years. Um, and that, so maybe that's maybe that's new. they've done exactly the going back to Elite Dangerous because I'll, I'll talk about Elite Dangerous all, all the time. <laughs> um. They've they've literally just announced that um, the brand new expansion for that Odyssey, yeah, isn't coming out for the PS4 um, and Xbox X. It's not coming out for the Series X, the PS5. They've just stopped development and they're just working on the PC one. Oh wow! Um, so that was a bit of a is kick it, in the teeth for them. Is, is that is that not the platform you're playing it on? Are you playing it on the Xbox? PC. PC? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's um, not good. But it's because it's because technology moves on. And unfortunately, when you buy a console, yeah, it's it's uh, it's at a level, a certain level when you buy it. But you can't upgrade it, can you? No. Um, no. And, and it moves, you know, Upgrades and technology moves that quick. Every six months, you've got a different graphics card. You've got faster mo memory. Um, consoles can't keep up. Yeah, the, the well, the amount, the thing that always has amazed me with PC gaming is that you know you, you you're not locked into a generation, are you? You can you can you can go and play Monkey Island now. Do you know what I mean? You can, you can go and play whatever you want now. You can even 
emulate the old consoles if the emulators are up to it you know yeah. if, well if the hardware is up to it and if if the development of the emulators far enough along you can emulate everything yeah. but with a console you know you're, you, you're just locked in aren't you mm. that there, there's more um there's there's more sort of focus going into backward compatibility now which is brilliant but the things that amaze me with with all of that as well it's like the xbox um it's like going back to the xbox one being able to play 360 games you know the xbox one can play all 360 games but it was locked to a list that microsoft deemed acceptable in terms of like you know there's no glitches or artifacting or whatever but you know if, if you bypass that list if you put your console into like developer mode oh, i don't that list yeah yeah, you, you could bypass that list or replace it with a different one, maybe, or however, whatever the mechanism is to get around it. And you can just boot every Xbox 360 game. Yeah, you pay 20 quid or one. something, don't you, for a developer? Yeah, yeah so I think it's I think it's 25 quid or 20 quid. Hmm. Um, again, that's pounds to everyone. Yeah. Not in the UK. <laughs> uh, Not dollars. But yeah, yeah, so it's about 20 quid, 25 quid. And you register as a developer you get your developer account and then you can run unsigned code on your xbox one so you can run emulators all that sort of stuff i guess you can run pirated games i'm not sure um something i haven't i haven't really looked into um but yeah you can bypass the list and run everything on on your xbox one i believe whether that means that they're going to run properly or not is a different thing. So we still think that that emulator's wrapped um, in. It, it, well, it's it's configured to run particular games a certain way. I think I it guess. was a PlayStation Two emulator. I heard about that's supposed to be top notch. Yeah, hmm. yeah, probably. Um, but yeah, so like backward compatibility now is is like it's, it's getting more focused, but. What I find strange about the industry now is things like the um, the licensing agreements that are scuppering digital purchases. So, like, do you remember Scott Pilgrim versus the World? Mm. Yeah. Do you remember that that disappearing forever and it's made a comeback now? Oh, right, okay. Yeah, and things like you know your Forzas and uh, and all that stuff, where there's licensing deals with car manufacturers. When those deals have expired that game's gone yeah that that's that's the problem when you're using those those licenses isn't it rather than just creating um say a car game but not naming the car yeah 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 so like so like in terms of game preservation you know like we talk about collecting we're preserving the games really yeah although we're doing it we're not sharing it necessarily with anyone Mm. but you know you've got a slice of history there in your room and you know it's safe as long as you keep it safe yeah. whereas if you buy a digital game and it's got some you know some some licensing problem with a piece of music or some artwork or you know just the model or whatever you know it gets removed from the digital storefronts and that's the end of it you can no longer buy it i know ducktales has, has gone through the same fate oh okay i think i'm not sure if it's still available now to buy what because of disney yeah something to do with some licensing problem um i'm not sure if it's disney that's the problem but you hear about these things and it's like really obscure games at the minute but eventually it's going to start affecting everyone because there'll be some franchise that everyone's sort of really interested in and all of a sudden it's it's just you can't buy it anymore yeah and i I find that all fascinating and i don't know where that sort of ends it's weird with um with with copyright and digital yeah it really is um, yeah whereas if you've got the disc you've got the disc they can't come and take the songs off the disc no. or remove the cars off the disc do you know what i mean it's there that's preserved well, it, it's funny you should say that it's it's uh i think that's the same as um quake the original quake yeah yeah my my version of it i've still got the the big box pc version of it well that music on there is, uh, it was all done by Nine Inch Nails. Oh, nice. So all the atmospheric music was Nine Inch Nails. Yeah. And then when it was first available on, 
on Steam. It's exactly the same for Quake 2. You'd play it, but there was no music because the way they used to, the same as the PlayStation games, it used to load the game up, but then yeah. it'd spin up as a CD player and yes, play the music. And the audio disc. off the disc. Yeah. yeah. So people were playing these these games with no music, and then I noticed with the because um, I've re-released Quake now. They must have done a an additional um, licensing agreement with Trent Reznor, I, I imagine, because you know Bethesda software are massive. Yeah. Um, and now you've got the music within the game again. Cool. As as a download. Yeah. Whereas before you had to have the physical disc to spin up the music. The the were ways of ripping the WAV files and um, using mods for the game. Yeah, to load the music. To, to load, load the music and act as a CD player. Yeah. Um, but that was the only way you could do Because most, as you know, most PC builds now, especially cases, no. they don't have the slot. No, no CDs. Yeah. It's strange, isn't it? Yeah. But it's like, yeah, yeah, no CDs. But uh, um, that that's what I found with this laptop, coming to, to fire that up. I hadn't thought about emulating it, but then I thought, well, so what I've had to do with that is illegally download the ISO. Well, you wouldn't be, first of all, you'd have to try and rip it anyway, wouldn't you? Yeah. And I did think, well, I have got, I have got a PC down here with a, with a DVD drive that would, I'd be able to do that with whatever it's called, DVD burner or whatever it was back in the day. Mm. I used to do like ISOs, but um, yeah. And then I thought, oh, I'll see if I can download it. And you know what? Like 20 minutes later, I've got the game again on the hard drive. And it runs fine on emulation. But I mean, I've got... Well, in theory... You know, back in the day when you get manuals. Oh, my. Now, my, my copy of... Because I, I got it from... Um, some guy was... I got like a little market store. Um, where was we? I think it was in Wales somewhere. Yeah. And I spotted that. And I think I, I, think I paid a tenner for it. Um, there's no manual. <laughs> really? Not, I've got no manual on my version. But um Yeah, yeah I suppose in, what I was gonna say was in theory you're not you're not pirating, are you? Because you've just got no, you've no. you've got the original there to show for I've it. Got the original, yeah. yeah. And, and 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 that that I guess it's a grey area, but if somebody come and said, Oh, you pirated the game, it's like well I own the game. It's so your backup. It's the backup, yeah. you you well I think you've allowed a personal backup anyway. Yeah. Yeah, oh. but isn't that funny? I've gone and brought it and then just gone on and, and downloaded it. Yeah. Just to, just to emulate it, but that's, you know, that's that's what you do for convenience, isn't it? At least I've brought it, I guess. Mm. <laughs> Mate, yeah. it's been amazing talking to you. I, I might Thank have you. to make this one into a two-party, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fun. I, I could talk to you for hours, I think. <laughs> Let me know how you can get on with your new game. And we'll get that. Uh, okay. I'll get, send you. I'll send you an early code. So, yeah. So, so send me some beta. So you can play it with a boy. That's it, mate. That's it. Right. And yeah. uh, I'll catch you soon, mate. Yes. As again, stuff. thanks very much. Cheers, mate.